Hi everybody, my name is Brett Rockos, I'm one of the orthopaedic registrars at the Palace to Surgery that is North Bristol. Uh, and what I'm going to present to you is how we're going to solve the problem with atypical femoral fractures. Uh, I'm going to be honest, I've put Andy and Mike's name on this, but this is my work. Um, so, <laughs> atypical fractures, we had a, a talk from Andy yesterday about them. Uh, we know that bisphosphonates work, we know they're saving hip fractures and moving on to saving elderly patients' lives in, in effect. Atypical femoral fractures identified not that long ago by uh, an endocrinologist uh, in 2005, and um, I certainly <coughs> became aware of them sort of a couple of years after that, and they're a growing problem. And just straw polling one person who I knew, um, they seem to be turning up more and more and more and more. I'm sure you're aware there are minor and major features that define an atypical fracture. Those were described in 2010, and they were modified in 14. Essentially, they Ones that look like that are atypical, everything else isn't. And they're about 1 to 1.1 per thousand per year, and that's certainly what we see in Bristol. If you're getting more than 1 to 1.1 per thousand per year, then uh, you're probably over-diagnosing them at the moment. And we know, and we've established yesterday, that they are difficult to treat. There's lots of different strategies around. We've tried nailing, plating, doing nothing, doing something. Um, Professor Moran talked about, as far as I could work out, smash the bone into bits and let it heal uh, through secondary intention. I quote Andy there, by the way, so uh, don't stack me. But we know that probably none of the strategies are answering all the, answering all the questions. So far, there's limited addressing the biology. We talked a bit about uh, parathyroid and hormone and things yesterday. <coughs> but it's about addressing the mechanical situation. But we don't know how best to do that. And the fact is, with 1.1 per thousand per year in each unit, unless we all work together, we're not going to get enough data to answer this problem. So it's a real old-fashioned surgical problem. It's a disease we know about, but we don't know how to treat, and we're all having a little go, seeing if we can work something out. We have some ideas, some are good, some perhaps not so good, and actually, you know, we're a, an unusual group in that we're going to be aware of these injuries. There will be surgeons out there who are treating these as sort of standard femoral shaft fractures that aren't perhaps, you know, <coughs> the typical fractures aren't at the top of their list. It is a rare condition, and we know what we do has variable results, and our series of 13, 14 in Bristol shows that 42% are written challenging to treat, but we got them wrong and they failed, in reality. So, in the words of the great Professor Blaisby, who's a general surgeon, sorry, collaboration is the new competition, so we shouldn't be competing to solve this problem anymore. We need to be working together to try and come up with solutions to this difficult problem. <coughs> We need to pool the data that exists to increase the resources to allow us to answer that question. Doing it on our own is not going to cut it anymore. Yet it will take years for a single unit to accumulate enough patients with enough power to decide what strategy is successful or not. And on that data, we need to do some science. And that's how it's described in our trauma unit, do some science. The good news is my idea is free. Okay, so we won't need big funding grants, we won't need lots of grant applications and so on. So I came up with the idea of the NAFD, which I then Googled and found it stands for the National Association of Funeral Directors, so I changed it to the National Atypical Fracture Database, which has a longer acronym, but what can you do? The idea is, this is a database where we're going to collect some important information about all the atypical femoral fractures that trauma surgeons deal with across the country. We're going to house it in North Bristol because we've got to have something to, you know, lift us. Okay, the idea is we get contributions from any hospital in the country who's interested and treats atypical femoral fractures. We don't want to take them from you, we just <coughs> want some information about those cases. It's very simple. You will have a PDF clickable form and you'll get your trauma fellows or your registrars to email it to us and we'll do the rest. Now, cumbersome, yes, but you only get 1.1 per thousand per year. So hopefully, you're only seeing four, five, six cases a year. Some of you will be more, some will be less. I appreciate that. But with that few, hopefully it's not too much of a burden to do that. We'll collect all the data together, and then it's the societies to use. So yes, it will sit on our computers, because it has to be somewhere secure within the NHS IT framework. But if someone wants data to test a theory, to describe the epidemiology to do anything, it's there to use, it's open source, obviously within the data rules uh, of the NHS. So you'll all contribute. Each trust will have a copy of that PDF form sit on that, sitting on their hard drive somewhere that will get filled in, <coughs> emailed to a dedicated account. 
I will make sure it's securely stored in North Bristol. The IT people in, the, in their caves have worked that out for us. And you'll be able to get the data when you need to through one of us. So what I brought today is the form that my IT person that I found online in Canada has written for us. Okay, um, I appreciate it's quite small. Hopefully you can see it on the screens and things. What I really want to do is show you this now. This is sort of the third iteration of the form. And if there are questions that you think, well, that's pointless, or there's things you think should be on there, then both me and Andy and Mr. Kelly would like to know. Uh, because I want to start this a couple of months ago, but I've held on so I can show it to you guys here today. We want to start in the spring, collecting data, and starting to build a resource where we can investigate these patients and try and come up with strategies that are going to work for a problem that's likely to grow as the years go by. So the first, the first sort of page of the form, there's only about two and a half pages, is the bog standard demographics, where was the fracture, and then the drugs taken pre-injury. Uh, some of these I've heard of, some of these I hadn't, but our also geriatricians have sort of refined this list. So there's the, the sort of standard bisphosphonates, abandonate, zalendronate, denusimab. We've added steroids in there because those are associated with a similar pattern to atypical fractures and some aromatase inhibitors. The next page goes on to ask about any other drugs they take pre-injury. Do they have any, any inflammatory comorbidities? Because we know those are more common in patients with atypical fractures. Some stuff about their pre-injury biochemistry, which will hopefully help answer the parathyroid hormone question later on. A little bit about the contralateral leg. Do they have any symptoms there? Are there any radiological features on the fracture leg or on the other leg that you know, sort of confirm or refute an atypical picture? Is there a varus deformity on the contralateral leg, like we saw on the slides yesterday, or is their other leg normal, and this is just an unusual sort of growth pattern or deformity? Did we do anything to the other leg? Did we give them another drug alongside doing surgery? Because that, again, will help answer whether we can address the biology in any useful way. Are there any local complications, which will be sort of further down the line, which will help tell us, well, actually, our surgical strategy is pointless because we're spending a fortune dealing with the complications? What are we doing with their bone health post-injury? Because even though they have an atypical fracture, we can't ignore the fact they're at risk of fragility fractures later on. And we know that that leads to death in quite a lot of patients. And then we have asked for a six-month follow-up, which is probably the only organisational sticking point. Someone in your unit, when you're participating, which I've no doubt you all will, will have to just keep an eye. And we will send you reminders saying, you sent us this patient you know, in February and it's now <coughs> August. Can you just tell us what's happened in the six months? And that will be for your trauma fellows or your trauma registrars or someone to do, not you. I don't want to add to your workload. And then if they've had any revision surgery. And then lastly, at the revision surgery, did someone excise the fracture site or not? And that's it. That's all we want to know about these atypical fractures. We think that will get the ball rolling to try and collect some information about dealing with these fractures that can become a bigger problem. So we want to start in the spring. It's a resource to solve the atypical fracture problem, which in the words of St. Jeremy of Clarkson gives us power. We want to expand it as time goes on. We are the OTA guest nation. I'm looking for a free ticket to go there, so hopefully we can present it there and see if we can grow this internationally. So do we think there are any other additional questions we could add in? Do you think any of those questions are unnecessary? Shorter forms get filled in better. And do you foresee, at this stage, with that description, any significant barriers to actually it being used? Bear in mind, you should only see four or five of these fractures a year, so it's not going to be every trauma list are filling in Brett's stupid form. Okay? It's just a few times a year to try and collect our experience and answer a difficult problem. That's it. <coughs> Any questions for Brett? Yep, okay, we've got a few here. Chris. Thanks very much indeed. Fascinating, and congratulations on the effort that you're making to solve this. Can I make a comment about the format of yes. your form? I suggest that each question has a number and that each option has a, an alphabetical code. So you've got one, A, B, C, D. So you don't have to, uh, you don't have to input um, uh, textual information. You put in alphanumeric codes. 
That's very much easier for any data processing system to handle. Yeah. The other thing is you might think about putting your boxes along a line, a vertical line, so that the, the forms can be scanned by a data scanner, mm. which will pick up which of the squares that. have been blocked in and not blocked in. And then it would automatically record 1A, 2D, mm. da, da. and that would be very easy for you to analyze when you've got a lot of data. That's that's a, a good idea. There are some limitations with the logistics of running something like this. So we, we wanted to do sort of a web-based data submission, but the IT people just said, no, don't It is a great idea. I really hope this is successful. Do we need patient consent? So I don't know is the honest answer. They are supposed to be consented to be entered into the NJR, for example. Yes, But we should, we probably do need it. Uh, it's all within the NHS system, so there's no consent needed for exporting that data outside the NHS system, but so we will do that. Uh, so it will just be a case of some, somebody asking. Well, you need to follow the usual information yeah. governance protocols, and under Coldicott, you have to. Yeah, so, so uh, they will just have to be asked. Because you're sharing their data with somebody, somebody else, so they have to consent to that. Yeah. Record that. Okay. If you, go, if you look at the other registries that are out there, it's very, very straightforward. So, you know, the National Knee Ligament Registry or the Osteotomy Registry, you, there's just a single line that needs yeah. to go in a patient's letter. Yeah. You've asked the patient and they have given consent, that's it. Well, we'll, we'll make sure that appears on sort of line one. Okay, I think. Okay.